Okay, so today I will be talking about Davocat scalability. And first, yes, what I will talk about. So some quick Davocat introduction for people who have no idea what it is about. Then some talk about uh, what Davocat code, a little bit about Davocat code. Uh, for all you coders there, since there's so many of you, maybe I can kind of try to trick one of you into becoming Davocat developer, maybe. Uh, then more about some clustering and how to scale Davocat with clustering. And then hopefully lots of time for questions. So what is Davocat? Originally written as an IMAP server, then also all kinds of things started happening for it, like pop server and ability to deliver new emails via LDA and LMTP, and then Stefan Bosch started writing C filtering language to uh, filter the mail into correct mailboxes and so on. And currently Davgat is still kind of expanding into lots and lots of different areas because it's kind of so modular and uh, easy to extend with plugins and everything. So, for example, I think the 2.3 version, which will come someday soon, well, not soon, but hopefully soon, uh, it will contain this HTTP server and proxying code, which would be possible to use as a base to creating all kinds of other HTTP-based servers, like, I don't know, maybe uh, someone might be interested in writing and some kind of web application server, I don't know, that seems maybe a little bit weird to write web application server with C language, but I think it would be pretty workable with Davcat. Uh, there's all kinds of other things that Davcat makes easier if you are writing a server, like you can already use all the existing SSL code, and if you need to authenticate users, you can use the same authentication server code, and um, of course, if you have, have anything to do with emails, there's lots and lots of email libraries parsing emails and doing all kinds of stuff with emails. But also for non-email stuff, there's nowadays more and more lots and lots of libraries. So if you were interested in about writing something based on Davgat, the core of Davgat is pretty minimal, like the process tree of what is required. Then there's the master process, which is very simple. It pretty much doesn't really do anything except start new processes. There's a few core processes like log, which does logging, of course, and config, which reads configuration, and then there's the authentication stuff, but that's not really started until authentication is actually used. And all kinds of other random processes, but one nice thing about all of this is that if you want to do something really weird, like log to SQL databases or maybe read configuration from SQL or some XML files or JSON files or whatever, you can just replace the existing log or config binary and do whatever, whatever you want to do yourself. Um, and of course, there's all kinds of plugins and modules that can be used to extend Davocat, like authentication can be done from pretty much anywhere you want, and if it doesn't support it, you can write a plugin to do that easily. The master process, um, it doesn't really know all that much about any of these except for the couple of core processes. So you can create, or you can configure in Davgat configuration new services, new processes. You can say that, uh, have this process listen to this and this uh, TCP port or Unix socket or all kinds of other things. And you can tell them what uh, execu executable to start and you can tell all kinds of limits and what privileges are used, like say uh, you can have some special process running in ch root and using some kind of, of non-privileged user. And also you can say that uh, if the process memory reaches more than like 256 megabytes, that's the default also. If it reaches above that, then the kernel will just kill the process because maybe there's a memory leak or something and restarting usually helps. 
Uh, so I've got code. It's written pretty much everything is in C language, but uh, cut C code isn't really, I don't think it's very much normal looking C code. There's all kinds of APIs that make the code much easier. Uh, so you don't want to kill yourself, I guess. Uh, the, there's all kinds of safe uh, string buffer arrays to make those types of things easy. That those are, of course, pretty much everywhere. The memory management is kind of nicer in Davacut. There's all kinds of memory pools and this data stack I will talk a little bit more about. So in general, when you are writing code in Davacut's coding style, it's kind of difficult to create security holes. Like I'm a pretty lazy person, so I just write kind of, I don't really, when I'm writing code, I don't really think about so much uh, security holes. I just write the way I always write and it just, well, there's pretty much never any, at least C, C language related security holes. Um, but still, even so, I have been thinking about maybe someday switching to a different language. C still seems to be pretty much the only usable language to write uh, Linux, Unix based server programs. But maybe, uh, well, there's some languages I kind of maybe like, but maybe they are not exactly ready yet and, or at least all kinds of de debugging stuff is much more difficult with them. So I'm still with C. Okay, I mean, it would be possible to switch to C++, I guess, and I, I have been thinking about C++, but I guess the main problem would be that there's a couple of, la couple of features in C++ that I would like to use, but if I actually started using them, I think pretty much everybody would start hating my C++ code because it would be so difficult from normal C++ code and then people would start hating me and so I don't really like that idea. And uh, so most of Davcat code is LGPL and then all of the core libraries or actually anything related to authentication is with MIT license. The idea was at some point that maybe, I think someone was asking me if they could integrate Davcat authentication to, was it Dragonfly BSD? And I was thinking, yeah, maybe, yeah, sure, okay. But of course that didn't happen. I don't know why, but uh, so that's still, if someone wants to do that, it's still possible. I kind of maybe at some point extract the authentication into a separate package or something. Davocat can be compiled without any external libraries, except usually you would want to use icon for doing uh, uh, character set translations from whatever char character set to UTF-8. And another, another thing is definitely open SSL to get SSL stuff. Maybe at some point uh, would be nice to support GNU TLS as well, but well, OpenSSL works and I have way too much stuff to do, so I haven't really spent time on it. So this data stack, I think, well, this is pretty much the only C language specific slide in here from now on. Uh, so the idea here was that, okay, so data stack, what I mean is it's kind of like a memory pool or it's kind of like a C control stack, but kind of merged them in a way that makes it much more nicer to write some types of C code. Uh, so like the one problem with C is that if you want to return some memory from a function, like you want to return a string and you kind of uh, want to return it from a stack, so that's not possible at all because the stack gets freed when you return, but then pretty much the only other possibility is that you allocate the string from somewhere and you return the string and then someone has to free it. But the freeing of the strings makes the code look horrible. So here's some example code, what Davcat code kind of could look like. Um, so there's the do stuff function and it takes a string as input, then uh, there's the full name, which is my name, and then you kind of want it to say that do stuff which with uh, hello Timo. So here's uh, like, uh, the TSTR cut takes my full name and then splits it from the space and then it returns the string allocated from the data stack and then there's the TSTR.printf which, well, does the hello demo and again returns from the data stack and nobody really 
needs to think about when the memory should be freed or anything. Uh, it gets freed sometimes later when the data stack frame ends and you can kind of control when the st stack frames start and when they end. And yeah, so this kind of uh, chaining of these functions, it, functions is kind of nice, I think makes it much more readable than if it was, I don't know, five lines with all kinds of free uh, temporary variables and freeing those temporary vari variables and so on. So that's all about the code. Uh, then some scalability stuff. Uh, I like asynchronous APIs, at least compared to threads, uh, especially if you are not kind of CPU bound Threads are kind of useless, at least in theory. Uh, sure, they make it somewhat easier to program some types of things, but if you want to have kind of the best performance with the least amount of context switches and least amount of uh, wasted memory, then some kind of uh, one process, one thread with these all kinds of asynchronous APIs would be most optimal, I think. So, for example, in Davocat code, there's this I'm a plugin, pop3 login processes and so on, which handle everything before the authentication is finished. So, and also they handle proxying to remote Davocat servers. So, one of these processes can handle at least tens, tens of thousands of connections. I haven't actually probably really tried how many can they really handle, but at least tens of thousands. So usually you configure these login processes so that if you have like C four CPU cores, then you will have four IMAP login processes, so there's no unnecessary context switching going on. But this, of course, gets really difficult if you want to do some kind of calls that are not asynchronous, like disk IO is always blocking, there's all kinds of other blocking things like my SQL library does only blocking lookups and so on. So solving disk I.O., well, one possibility I, could, I guess could be um, if you are interested in yeah, asynchronous disk I.O. From kernel point of view, I don't think there's really any usable API for that. There's something that can do reading and something that can do writing. But I think that also bypasses all kinds of caching in Linux at least. But even if it didn't, there's really, it really can't do anything except read and write already open file descriptor. So there's, for example, there's even no asynchronous opening of a file. So if you open a file and it takes several milliseconds and then you have thousand other connections in the same process, then all the other thousands of connections, they are just waiting for you to open that one file, which could take forever. So one kind of solution for this is if you upload, upload the disk I.O. and other all kinds of blocking stuff to these kind of temporary worker processes. Uh, so the idea here wouldn't be to uh, offload one simple small read to a different process that would be horrible. But like in Davcat's case, for example, there's uh, full text search indexing. Uh, there's this indexer master process which, they, uh, which tracks which users or which mailboxes are being indexed at this time. And then it creates these indexer worker processes which start indexing one single mailbox for the user. And so it's kind of a big job for the worker process to do, but when it's finished, then it just returns that I'm done and then the process can be reused for other stuff. I have been thinking about maybe creating some kind of my own asynchronous disk IO API which uses threads, uh, but I don't know, probably not really worth the effort and trouble and other kinds of problems. So I know, uh, well, asynchronous APIs can be really annoyingly difficult sometimes. I think in Davocat they are usually not that difficult to use, or con but depending on how complex code you are writing, it can get horribly complicated. I know there's some libraries that kind of try to make 
this work kind of as if it were threads, but they wouldn't really be using threads. They would be somehow just saving, saving the state and jumping around. I haven't actually used those myself because they look really scary to me because I don't know what will happen when you jump around in the code that weirdly. Uh, but maybe I should look at those at some point. So other stuff, uh, locking files. One big problem in DAVCAT's uh, past when it first started, uh, I was locking all the DAVCAT index files for reading and there were all kinds of problems like when the client, IMAP client starts a really long fetch command, which like fetches all the message buddies and so on. It could take really long time sometimes if the user had a uh, user had a slow network connection or maybe if the network connection, connection dropped completely then it would take minutes for the network to realize that okay let's kill this connection and so uh, if the same user had been accessing the same mailbox from multiple clients and one of them locked the index for reading at the start of the fetch and should have unlocked it when, it when the fetching was done. Then the other connection, if it tried to do any of kind of writing to the index, like maybe even changing a message flag or something, then it would be waiting for the reader to finish and maybe that would take forever and maybe the locking would time out. And this was getting really bad at some point. So then I realized that this can't work. I have to redesign the whole thing. So. Nowadays, there's no read locking in DAVCAT ever, except the mbox format, which requires it, and that's really, that it has exactly the same problem, that if someone is reading from the mbox file and someone is trying to write, deliver a new mail to it, then the new mail delivery may fail because someone is reading it. So that's why nobody really should be using mbox format for, unless maybe personal mails or something. Um, so how to solve it then, of course, depends on your application or whatever you are doing, but the idea would be in general to design those kinds of efficient file structures where you do not overwrite any data, you will just append or recreate the files all the time. So there's no problem just reading the file because it's nothing changes inside of the file. And I think this is better in any case for these new file systems, these copy and write file systems like ZFS and ButterFS and so on, which would do pretty much that in any case internally or otherwise at least then fragment the files, which slows down the reading. So the other thing, write locks, of course you really should keep the writing locks as uh, short-lived as possible. Again, no magic solution, I guess, just try to keep it slow, <laughs> small. Uh, one idea I had been thinking about previously was would it be possible to get rid of the write locks entirely if you do this atom atomic appending to files, like in Linux, for example, there's the O append flag, which seems to work, being able to do append, uh, atomic appends. So then maybe it wouldn't require locking at all, but I haven't really done that because probably not worth the effort and I don't know if it would work 100% sure. Another thing, um, one problem, current problem in DAVCAT nowadays is that, especially in bigger installations, that IMAP has this idle command where it waits, uh, waits for the client, uh, I mean the client starts the idle command and the client says that I want to see if there's any, any changes happening to this mailbox, like especially if new mails are coming. Uh, so they keep the TCP connection, IMAP connection open pretty much forever and they are not doing nothing but idling there and waiting. So problem with that is that each IMAP process currently is taking some like one or two megabytes of memory. So with bigger installations, it's wasting a lot of, lot of memory which is not very good. So the new idea is to just add some APIs and so on to DAVCAT so that you can kind of export this current 
IMAP connection state into a pretty small string, and then you move the connection to a new IMAP idle process where you could, the one IMAP idle process could be handling, again, like thousands of connections. And if some new mail arrives, of, arrives for the user or if the IMAP client stops the idle, then the, it just recreates the IMAP process and sends the uh, connection back to and restores the state and, and continues working normally. So this hopefully will reduce a lot of Davocat memory usage in future. And it could be also used the same session saving and restoring for other interesting things. Like you could, if you have a Davocat cluster and multiple backends, you could move the IMAP connection from one backend server to another one without having to disconnect the client. And also maybe if the server is completely overloaded uh, with like, well, IMAP connections, then you could kind of throttle the server by keeping those connections in the IMAP idle processes even when there's some stuff to do and hope that the overloading goes away or maybe move those connections to other, another server to reduce the load and so on. But again, so the biggest problem in Davgat is really disk I.O. or has been and everything is optimized for disk I.O. Uh, especially the index files in the beginning uh, one, in, uh, one important thing here is that to, okay, so Davgat has these index files and cache files, which are well, kind of the same, really. And in the cache files, there's all kinds of stuff cached, like some message headers, like from to subject, or message sizes, or dates, and whatever. And IMAP clients are kind of annoying because they some different clients behave differently and fetch different headers and different fields and so on. So, Davocat only caches exactly those fields that the users, IMAP clients need. No more and no less. So, um, if it cached more, then of course that increases the cache file sizes, which increases disk I.O. and used disk space and nothing None of that is very good, but then there's some problems like what if user switches to a different IMAP client which uses different headers, then, okay, if it needs more headers, then of course Davcat needs to add more stuff to the cache, but then if the user also stop use, stops using some headers, it would be nice to get rid of those headers eventually in the cache file, so that's also possible by just keeping track of what fields exactly Davcat is. Um, of what fields exactly the IMAP clients are accessing. And then if some field hasn't been accessed for, a, I think it was one month, then Davocat just drops that field from the cache. There's also some clients like Thunderbird Outlook, which usually only download headers for new emails. So it's kind of pointless to keep all the old headers in the cache. Um, if they are never accessed at all. So Davocat also kind of keeps track of the, this if the user is using only these types of IMAP clients and then it deletes all the data from the cache file that is older than one week or so. So the cache file keeps uh, small and disk I.O. will be good and disk space usage will be slow, uh, small. <laughs> so that's good. Another thing disk I.O. So there's the traditional inbox and mail, mail their formats, which Davocat first supported, but they are not that great. So there's, I wrote this SD box and MD box formats, which are mostly the same. Uh, in both cases, one of the important things is that message flags are only in the Davocat index files and they are not in those actual inbox, uh, MD box, SD box formats themselves. So because this, this is highly Davcat specific uh, format. Um, compared to MailDir, the SD box has two main advantages. Like with MailDir, it has to read DIR all the time because the, there's new mails coming in and mails are being renamed. The message file name contains the message flags. So the file names are kept rename, being renamed all the, t all the time. And with SD box, none of this is happening. Uh, which is very good, and then compared to uh, SD box versus MD box means that 
with SDBox there's just one mail per file, but with MDBox there's multiple mails in each file, but still there's multiple files, like maybe each file could be some like 10 megabytes or 100 megabytes or so. And usually nowadays MDBox is much faster than SDBox because sequential disk I.O. still seems to be much faster, uh, even with SSD disks, uh, if like reading one big email, uh, one big file compared to reading many small files, it's always faster to read the bigger file. Uh, with MDBox, one kind of annoying thing maybe is that when you are when you delete a mail, it's not actually the disk space is not freed immediately. It's just marked that this, the reference count is zero, and then you will have to have some kind of a nightly cleanup run, which goes through all the users and uh, checks if there's some mails that need to be deleted, and then kind of if you have a huge file, then it just takes a, those mails that are not deleted and writes them to a new file and deletes the old file and so on. So in both these SDBox and MDBox formats, the write locks are really short-lived. Again, like you could have, you could be delivering thousands of mails in parallel, parallel to either of those formats, and the write locking only happens at the final commit time when the index is updated and all the IMAP UIDs are assigned and so on. Another kind of interesting optimi optimization for some of these systems is that you could keep the new emails in a kind of fast storage, fast expensive storage, and then the old emails in cheaper storage, which probably has less disk I.O. capacity. So, yeah, called alternative storage. Okay, so this is all about single server stuff, so then going to Davcat clusters. Um, NFS. Uh, Davcat is, or have been and still is being, uh, Courier is still being replaced by Davcat in a many, many installations nowadays. Uh, in Courier cluster, Courier NFS cluster, the way it usually works is that you have a load balancer which uh, pretty much randomly redirects all the IMAP and pub connections to one of the backends. And as long as the load balancer can do IP stickiness, this works pretty well. I'm not sure if it works perfectly with Courier, but well enough that nobody really at least notices those problems if there are any. But with Davcat, this is very, very bad because the Davcat index files are much more complex than anything that Courier has. So anybody who tries to do this will just keep getting corrupted index files and so on. Main problem, main reason for this is because NFS clients, the kernel, does all kinds of caching for all kinds of things which of course is very good because it improves performance, but very bad if you actually want to uh, read the non-cached data. Like one problem, especially with Davgat, is that because it has multiple index files and all of them have some kind of dependencies for each others, but then the NFS clients, client pretty much randomly seems to be able to kind of sometimes return new data for some files and old data for, for these other files. I've tried at some point to make sure that this doesn't happen by trying to flush the NFS cache so that if I notice that there's some problem, so I flush the NFS cache and I try again, maybe it gets, gives me the new data. And this kind of worked somewhat well, at least it reduced the corruption significantly. But there's still some cases where it really doesn't work perfectly. And I kind of abandoned this idea. I think if you disable the NFS attribute caching entirely, then Davcat will probably work fine, except the performance will be horrible. And because of this, uh, even if there is explicit cache flushing, if it was possible and if it, even if it worked perfectly, it would still be kind of bad 
because it increases the NFS server load and it increases latency if a couple of different servers were all the time bouncing between each other's. Have you done something? No, yes, something. So not very good. So to solve this stuff, I finally created this director cluster idea. Um, the idea here, the, or the original idea that I had was that, okay, so Davgat already has a proxy in code, so what if each user is assigned to some specific backend server, so it does an SQL lookup, and the SQL lookup tells that this user belongs to this SQL server, and then um, if that server goes down, then there's something, some Thing, uh, looking at the server, servers and seeing that, okay, this server is down, let's up, update all those users into some different servers in the SQL, and yeah, that would work somewhat well, but it would have kind of a lot of trouble still uh, if you want to add more servers or remove servers, well, mo mostly just adding servers would be problematic because if you want to, then you have to move some user from one server to a different server and then the user might still have some connections to the old server and now it starts getting connections to new server. So then again, the problem that there's two backends at the same time as uh, accessing the same user's data. So that's not very good. So then I had this idea for director, which basic idea is still that you take the MD, MD5 hash of the username and then take a modulo and modulo by the number of backend servers and based on that you just, each of the director proxies will know directly that okay, this user goes to exactly this backend server. So this is still kind of the same as with the SQL lookup, um, but then there's all kinds of other extra complexity which makes the director not so simple as I thought in the beginning, but it does make it possible to move users between different backends and especially to add more, add more backend servers and remove backend servers and the directors will just kind of automatically assign, uh, redirect the users to proper servers. In like 99.99% like of the time, there's no need for the directors to talk to each other. All of them know exactly that this user's MD5 is this, so the user goes here. So there's no extra latency because of these director communications. But for those non-normal situations, the directors still have to talk to each other, so they are connected in kind of TCP connections using this kind of ring connection formation, so each uh, director is connected to a new one and that's connected to a new one and so on. But, and then if there's some, uh, if the one director needs to broadcast something to all the others, then the messages go kind of both sides of the ring. So even if the ring is, if some server dies and the ring is temporarily not the really, really ring but a line, then the message, the messages still reach all the other servers Without, without having to wait for the ring to heal. Um, so that's kind of the basics of the director. I think somewhere in the inter internet there's more uh, complicated explanation of this. Um, so I think this user stickiness is even if I've assumed that I had infinite time to implement whatever complex thing I wanted. I think, I think this user stickiness is still much, uh, or kind of the ideal way to handle this for Davocat because it makes everything so much simpler and performance is also better because um, if the user always goes to the same server, that user might, uh, that server might already have all the user data in cache and so there's much less, well, also much less server-to-server -server communication and also for the memory allocation, memory stuff. So if two servers handled the same user at the same time, then both servers would have to cache all the same user data. So there's also wasted memory in that way. So user stickiness good for Davocat. Oh, yeah, one kind of problematic thing is uh, if if um, you have shared mailboxes, then how do you handle 
multiple users accessing the same shared mailbox. Well, the problem or the solution is kind of that you have to create a new IMAP connection which goes through the directors and so that the shared mailbox or the shared user is still accessed using the same server using kind of normal IMAP protocol connection. Here's again some, well, quick uh, picture about this. Uh, pretty much shows exactly the same I was just talking about. Dovcat, pro, uh, Dovcat directors, backends. Uh, directors can handle tons and tons of connections. Backend can, backends can handle much less connections because they are kind of memory limited. Uh, and of course anything can fail or be added and removed and everything is good. If you need to have, okay, so one problem with directors is that because they need to talk to each other, so there's some kind of state between them. So there's some upper limit to how many directors you can have in one cluster. I don't know what exactly the limit is, but I haven't really done bigger than 10 servers in one director cluster. So if you want to have multiple sites, especially, you really shouldn't create one huge director cluster, but you should have this, here's again like this Dovcat backends and Dovcat directors, and then in front of them there's this another pro proxying layer. And here, again, this is kind of the idea that each user is still primarily assigned to some specific uh, cluster. And these proxies look up from SQL or somewhere that, okay, it looks like this user goes to this cluster and redirects the user to that cluster. And then it goes through the directors back to the original place. And if you want to have some uh, site failover, then you just, now again, the idea that you just update the SQL or, L or something in a way that uh, assigns, those, assigns those users to a different site temporarily. Um, object storage, a little bit about quickly about this. Looks like I don't really have time much left. Um, so I really like object storage nowadays. Kind of annoying that the Dowgat object storage plugin isn't currently open source. I think it might at, maybe at some point in future, but well, we'll see. Anyway, object storage is really nice uh, in a way because it allows pretty ma massive scalability and um, really easy clustering if you want to create a huge object storage that has sites all over the world and you can access all the data from wherever in the world, you can do that. And the way this is possible is because the operations are really simple. Um, you pretty much just have like ability to, to get, put, uh, delete files and list some files. Usually it's somewhat high latency, so if you want to code for it, you pretty much have, has to, have to assume that it's somewhat slow and pretty stupid and you have to put all the complexity in the application code and then you kind of have to cache the data locally. The way Dovcat does is that it puts the index files as these bigger bundle objects into object storage and then downloads them to local disk and kind of un unpacks them locally, uh, modifies the indexes locally and then in the background it's once in a while uploads them back to the object storage. Uh, the nice, uh, nice thing about this is also that, 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 that in split brain, op split brain operation is also possible and so if there's same mailbox is being mod modified in a couple of different data centers like USA, Europe at the same time and then there's still kind of no problem. Uh, Dovcat just creates two indexes to the object storage. At some point it realizes that there's two indexes and then it merges those indexes, merges those changes using desync, which already can do this. And no changes get lost. So that's nice. Mm. So last thing here, uh, desync replication. This is completely um, separate from the object storage stuff. And I think this is really interesting for smaller installations. Um, it's the same thing I just mentioned that if you modify the same mailbox from in two, two different places, you can use desync to merge the changes. So in desync replication, the idea is exactly the same thing. You could have a couple of different really cheap virtual servers from different places and 
you could run Dovecot in both places. Both places can uh, get new emails, new mails can be delivered. The, it's probably not that great idea to have the IMAP clients randomly connect to di two different servers, but you can do, again, this kind of proxying or directors to make sure that one user goes usually to the one server and then if the server is down, then it goes to the other one uh, using, I don't know, like maybe some DNS, uh, DNS updates. And yeah, not really meant for huge installations, although there's one installation, I think, with a couple of million users with these kind of replication pairs. Also, our own Dovcat, uh, Dovcat.fi emails, they are in this kind of desync replication cluster. And I intentionally, I have like four different IMAP clients. I connect two of them to the one replica and two of them to the other one. And also the incoming emails more or less randomly go to the two different servers and everything seems to work fine. So I like this. And questions, I think the idea is to have mics and people maybe lining here or maybe, I don't know, <laughs> because the yeah. Anything? <laughs> yeah, the problem, I guess, is if you have lots of lots of questions, then huge room and... Uh, just a small question. Um, the caching, you said yep. you only uh, cache headers that are um, used by the clients. What if you have different clients? Yeah, it's the same thing still. Davgat just sees that some client is sending this kind of IMAP command, fetching this header, maybe another client or maybe the same client is fetching some other stuff. So Davgat really doesn't actually even know how many clients you are using. It only knows what the clients are fetching. Okay, cool. Any uh, you said uh, desync based replication is not meant to be used for use huge installations. So what do you recommend if we have uh, 100,000 mailboxes to replicate them? 100,000 isn't really big, I think. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but um, actually, yeah, I think re desync replication probably works for that. But yeah, uh, the company idea nowadays is to sell object storage, try to sell so that the kind of the idea is to uh, hope that at some point in the future we would have enough coders so that everything wouldn't be, dip so that, well, if I die or something, then everything would still go fine because there would be so many other more Dovecat coders hired. But yeah. Uh, just a question about, um, yeah, I'm working on OpenLDAP and at one time I looked at your SASL code to see if I could integrate it. Uh, I had a hard time extracting it into something usable. Uh, do you plan to split that out into a standalone package? Uh, yeah, the, you mean SASL server code, right? Yeah. Uh, the way, okay, so the way it works is the Dovecat authentication server is always accessed through either Unix socket or TCP connection using some uh, commands in there. So, it's not at least meant for a library. It will never be a library code like the Cyrus Sassel, but maybe if enough people or if someone actually extracts, extracts the Dovecat in or splits the Dovecat into a couple of different like Dovecat core libraries, Dovecat authentication, Dovecat other mail stuff, then I'm not against it. And yeah, like I said, that the idea was at some point that someone wanted to put the authentication code into Dragonfly BSD, I think. Uh, so it would be nice, but yeah, currently I guess it's not so easy. But nothing really prevents you from optionally, optionally kind of providing this, uh, providing this API or this TCP socket or something to authenticate against Dovecat. Like there's already code in Postfix and Exim and everything to authenticate against Dovecat. So OpenLDAP could do the same thing.
I also have a partly a question, partly a comment. I'm not sure if I get uh, the, your comment uh, right uh, on the I'm a Idle feature. Okay. Uh, uh, I have uh, seen in other clients, uh, other server implementations, that they just drop uh, the idle connections after a while and the client will just reconnect. For example, I think Zimbra da does this way. Yeah, so okay. So. Well, a couple of things. Um, I'm up idle command, it's not really supposed to disconnect. I'm up specification says that after 30 minutes the server is allowed to disconnect if the client hasn't sent anything. So the clients really should be doing like 29 minutes of idle, then restarting the idle command so that they wouldn't disconnect. Except the clients are buggy, or they haven't really realized that they should be doing this. So with some servers, or yeah, I think Thunderbird, Apple Mail, at least at some point they didn't do this, they just idled forever and if nothing happened, then um, yeah, some servers disconnected. But I think that's more of like a bug. So nowadays, nowadays Davgat doesn't disconnect them ever. And even if Davgat disconnects them, I think most of those clients will simply just reconnect and restart the idle. So it's not really a solution to disconnect them anyway. So yeah. The, okay. Yeah. Uh, from a server's perspective, which is the buggiest client? Uh, so, sorry, I didn't hear that. From a... Uh, uh, from a server's perspective, which is the buggiest client? Uh, buggiest okay. client. The client that has the most bug and that fucks up Dove code the most. And <laughs> I, so, ah, sorry. One last time, the. Uh, Last couple of words. <laughs> Bugs. Ah, client. Right. Well, actually nowadays, well, all of the IMF clients are somewhat stupid, I think, nowadays. Uh, they don't really do all that much. There's a couple of workarounds for a couple of client bugs. I think Thunderbird maybe has most bugs. Because it does a little bit more than some other clients, so it has a little bit more bugs, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So for directory storage, or uh, for, for storage in, uh, in key value uh, systems uh, like S3, uh, you mentioned um, uh, object stores, rather. You mentioned uh, list as being a required operation. Um, for for Dovecot, uh, it's a fairly expensive operation um, for for the indexes in those uh, those systems generally. What are, what are you using list for? Listing, for listing. Yeah. Um, um, so well, those object storages that Dovecot currently supports, all of those do support listing, and uh, of course not listing all the objects but listing at least with some specific prefix. Um, well, okay, I mean, I know with, for example, Amazon S3, if you try to list only the files in the root directory, it's actually listing all of the files everywhere and just filtering out everything except the stuff in the root. So that's horribly expensive. Uh, but yeah, Davgat simply just kind of assumes that with the, some specific prefix, it's fast enough. I had some ideas about how to kind of create my own listing for the files, my own directory listing, but that's kind of horribly complicated. But maybe I will do it at any point at some point, yeah. Okay, we have time for, uh, okay, we have time for one last question. So, anybody? No? Okay, thanks a lot, Timo.